Well, let's get started. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Sharice Grace, and I am with the Trade, Marketing, and Stewardship team at the Almond Board of California. We are thrilled to host today's digital panel discussion about social media and its effects on the food industry and product development. Our moderator, Luann Williams from Innova Market Insight, will lead today's discussion. Our panelists include Tom Cheesewright, Applied Futurist, Suzanne Higgs, an expert in the psychology of eating, and Aaron, Aaron Seidel, food scientist and social media thought leader, who we all follow as food science babe. We welcome everyone to participate in today's interactive polling questions as they appear on the side of your screens. You can also submit questions for our panelists via the Q&A box. If you submit a question that we are unable to answer live today, we will follow up with you via email. At the close of the event today, you can also provide feedback through a brief pop-up survey to help us advance future content. Now, before I pass it over to Luann, we ask that you follow our new LinkedIn page, Nuts About Almond Inspiration. Here we post the latest manufacturer resources from the Almond Board. We are happy at any time to be a resource for questions about formulating with almonds, so please feel free to reach out to us at any time. Again, our new LinkedIn page is Nuts About Almond Inspiration. So now let's get started and we'll turn it over to you, Luann. Enjoy. Thanks, Cherise. So the first thing we're going to do today is start with the polling question. So um, we have one question. Has social media ever influenced your product development or marketing? I think that's a great question. If we'll give you a couple of minutes to answer that, it'll stay open. And as soon as we close the question, we can all see the results and then we can maybe talk about it a little bit later with our, our panel. But this is a huge topic. And so we're very curious to know for any of you that are watching that are working on product development or marketing, has social media ever had an influence over that? Okay, it'll stay up. The question will stay up on the right hand side. So please make sure that you all answer that. Um, so before we start our panel discussion today, um, I have just a couple of slides to, to share to provide a little bit of context. So um, I work at Innova Market Insights. We're a market research company, and every year we do our top 10 trends. Some of you might be familiar with this. This is from two years ago, and we had the age of the influencer on our trend, li our trend list. And it, it was such an interesting topic that year. I actually did um, a panel discussion that, that Food Science Babe was on, Aaron participated. And we really saw kind of the end of what I would call the total free for all era, we thought, I, th I still think so. And we started seeing a lot more science-based communicators, for example, we started seeing, um, I think Gen Z is becoming a lot more critical about what they see online. Um, if we go to the next slide, we have a few examples here, but just to, I think we had to acknowledge the impact that social media does have on, on food trends, what consumers are seeing and so on. You can see here that our consumer research showed that a third of consumers, this was across 11 countries, um, age 26 to 35, said that they take pictures of their food and share it um, at least once a week. We know food was the number one topic on Instagram at this time. And we know that, yeah, there's a lot of discussion about TikTok driving so many trends, but also, um, yeah, in the food industry. Here was a few examples, um, the coconut cloud smoothie, um, yeah, a new beverage also containing um, almond milk um, butter boards. So we saw a lot of butter boards over the past few months made with you know dairy butter, but also then that starts a new trend uh, trend with almond butter boards. There's an example there, um, the Dalgona coffee you might be familiar with, and even things like the way things are made and this oddly satisfying trend. We see things dripping, and in this case, it's pulling bones out of really cooked meat. So. You know, who would have ever thought? So I, I saw another one about um, tin tuna being promoted as being a, a gourmet choice. So you just don't know like where these trends are coming from. So we're gonna explore that today. And on the next slide, I think looking into the future because we have a futurist here today, just to kind of look at demographics a little bit, we do um, a mega trends every year. And this was um, our mega trend, new sources of influence. And if you just, if you can read there on the left, but um, by 2050, half the, the global youth market will be in Asia. And then Africa will be another region with just a, an explosion of growth with this youth market that are very active in this whole social media um, 
you know, wave. And we also know that there's no boundaries anymore. I know certainly my Gen Z kids can tell you what's happening in Korea or China or Japan or there. It's a global market, a global consumer market from the in terms of influence. So that's something that we might want to think about today that this is we're talking about it within the context that we're currently operating. But this is going to be a, a massive topic um, in the coming years. And with that, we now want to move to talking to our panel. So Therese did a great job of introducing everyone. Um, and we're going to start with uh, a question for Tom. And Tom, there's a, a lot of topics now. Food has, I think, never been so interesting. We've seen big shifts over the past few years with the pandemic. Um, and now we see a lot of socio-political changes coming up. Now we have our cost of living crisis. So I'd like to know what you see happening, what buzzwords you see having an impact, um, and how do you expect things to evolve? So I guess what we're looking for here is is partly the trends. Um, so you know, in terms of food, what we're looking for when we're looking at trends is quite often uh, other parts of the world, how are things going to spread. And you mentioned Asia there and Africa, clearly huge influences, and actually you know, influences that are already playing out. Um, but as well as the trends, we're also looking at things that might sort of stop the trends in their tracks. Where do those trends bump up against certain pressures in individual countries? And trying to understand the spread of those trends you've really got to understand the local pressures as well and you mentioned the cost of living crisis there that's clearly a you know a particularly big influence um some of the sort of pressures around the environment you know these trends are bumping up against that and where those two intersect i think that's where we see the really big changes and so you, know, you mentioned asia i think korea is really interesting because the food trend has spread alongside a lot of other trends as well you've got this globally connected middle class information spreading online but also food trends spreading alongside things like the dominant car manufacturers, cinema, music, technology, all coming from Korea as well. And so you can see these sort of food trends riding on a wave of adjacent trends in different areas, and then actually landing in a, in a country and perhaps overcoming some of those local pressures with the help of local champions being picked up by particular people and distributed online. And so you, you sort of understand trend coming, the pressure that might stop it, but also what the local factors that might help it to get out there. And so sort of examining all of that, you know, looking at what's going to happen over the year ahead, you start to look at trends like sort of aspirational trends um, in terms of people really wanting to live those healthy lifestyles, very much front of mind for people at this time of year. These aspirations in terms of actually being seen to consume natural, healthy goods, um, live that sort of green lifestyle as well, but bumping up against those local pressures in terms of cost of living. And I think there's going to be a really interesting tension there this year between this aspiration to um, pursue these healthy lifestyles, eat these great looking, you know, shareable um, whether it's snacks or meals, but also trying to fit within the constraints of our, of our current living environment and actually quite often living in different conditions as well. You know, we're really starting to see the maturation of a lot of working from home culture um, that really kicked off in the pandemic and is now starting to be a bit more established, a bit more familiar and people trying to understand how to do it well. And I think that's going to have a big impact on food trends over the year ahead as well. Interesting. And Aaron, what about you? Does this align with what you're seeing um, and, and what you're hearing on social media? Yeah, definitely. I think, um, you know, just everything being so global and then, you know, cost of living, all that. And then I, I also see on my side of it, too, um, I think a big thing that has changed over the past few years that I've been seeing as well is just sort of like there's there's, of course, you know, New Year, like healthy eating, all that kind of stuff. But I do see quite a bit of like pushback against that with like anti-diet, um, you know, a lot of dietitians pushing like anti-diet. And, and so it's just interesting now because I feel like that was never really challenged in the past. Like it was always like, oh, new year, start a new diet. And I'm just seeing more of that being challenged. And um, of course, there's always like a lot of myths that come come along with healthy eating and all that kind of stuff. So that's kind of where my content comes in is I challenge those myths and, you know, debunk misinformation regarding certain foods and certain ingredients. And so, um, so yeah, I mean, I think it's definitely being on social media, being, having it be so global. And then um, on top of that, I think just pushing those 
those things that used to be very common that nobody really questioned. Now you're having, you know, people question it and um, give their opinions on it. So I feel like that has changed a lot in the last couple of years. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Do you think it's like experts that are pushing back or do you also see consumers pushing it back? Against well, I've seen a lot like dietitians specifically like pushing back against um, diet culture essentially um, because, you know, my generation, we sort of grew up in the age where it was everything was, you know, everything was diet and we, you know, there are a lot of people with disordered relationships with food and eating disorders and stuff like that. So I think um, a lot of that is getting pushed back from not only, I mean, I would say it's coming from um, dietitians and stuff like that. And yes, it's getting to consumers now. So now consumers are pushing back against that. But um, I follow a ton of dietitians that are sort of pushing back against that um, diet culture type of thing. That's really interesting. So maybe to all of you. So we've heard health, we heard green, we heard aspirational living. I think certainly a lot of aspirational living is around um, you know, health is the new wealth. You know, I, I think it is something that people do aspire to. And then I think this whole question about fads versus trends versus food norms. So is there anything else? And Suzanne, you might want to to chime in. Anything else you see that you think that illustrate is illustrative of what's gonna come or what's gonna go or what kind of content is gonna stick? I mean, I think it's interesting to perhaps make a distinction between, you know, the sort of viral trends that might be quite short lived. So, you know, things that are spreading very quickly, but then, you know, they're not they're not sticking, um, you know, that are due to sort of exposure to to lots of different types of um, foods and trends that we wouldn't get exposed to, uh, you know, perhaps normally in our everyday life versus then perhaps what we might be seeing in terms of longer term shifts in social norms that can that can happen via exposure to what you know our closer social groups uh, are posting on, on social media so i think that idea of um perhaps seeing you know uh social groups that we want to affiliate with looking at their patterns of behavior um you know if what we're seeing out there is a is a shift say you know towards um a certain um healthier you know, type of um, pattern of eating, then it may be that we would be more inclined to shift in that direction ourselves because we want to fit in. We we think that that's the new normal. So those sorts of things, you know, might stick more than the sort of uh, one off, you know, viral trends. So I think that idea of, um, you know, the, the sort of social support that you get for, for posting certain things online as well can be quite reinforcing. So, so those, those sorts of trends, you know, m might out, outlive some of some of these um, more faddy things. Okay, so maybe to all of you, uh, hypothesis here, could we say that some of these big viral things that absolutely explode are more indulgent based and maybe some of the trends that are maybe there's more of a drumbeat is more of the healthy type of you know, health, clean label, sustainability kind of things. And this is maybe has a higher chance of establishing a food norm? Is that fair? To I, think, I, I think I think true, but we also have to acknowledge a sort of porosity between the two. You know, if there is enough of a drumbeat going, then you're you get you know, the retailers pick up on it. Um, you start to get that, you know, that greater demand for it, whether it's raw ingredients or pre-produced products. And so you know, there is some that you can't sort of dis completely disconnect one from the other, um, but it takes quite a strong and persistent trend before it starts to get into the supply chain. You know, even with the sort of speed of innovation now, which has accelerated in this industry over the last few years, it still has to be a really demonstrable demand before it starts to come through. Anyone else have anything to add? Yeah, I mean, I agree with that. There's so many things that um, I think that's the difficulty too, just with, uh, you know, companies like getting in on trends because it's like it, it, it's something is viral and then the next day, like nobody even remembers it. And so by the time a large company or even a smaller company decides like, oh, let's make a or let's partner with a social media influencer or something, it's like it nobody cares anymore. So I've seen that as a difficulty as well, just like partnering with companies because 
it's like that's that you know like let's debunk this thing that was like you know a month ago and it's like nobody even remembers that so that can be challenging yeah that that's a huge risk like i saw something recently about the pink sauce i think walmart's going to introduce the pink sauce and some of these things that it does just seem to move so fast so i'm really curious to see what the results of our poll will be because yeah, what do you pick if you're going to be, if you do want to follow trends from social media, it's really difficult if you're a food manufacturer or an ingredient supplier and you want to follow some of these trends. So, Suzanne, maybe you can continue, let's dive into this whole topic of health um, a little bit more that I have to say it's my kind of, I'm not, as a, I, I'm, I'm a spectator, but I do feel like there's a huge amount of discussion around, around healthy eating. Okay, we're all jealous when we see the people with the green smoothie and the egg white, you know, omelet at the breakfast buffet because we're all eating chocolate croissants and we wish we could eat like that. Um, but we know that people are interested and and yeah, okay, we're we're sponsored by the almond board today. So if we use almonds as an example, that they have a lot of health benefits, heart health, weight management, all kinds of, you know, even skin health. I've re I've learned more recently. How do you encourage more people to learn about the benefits or the science driven benefits and how do you get them to buy into them beyond a health benefit or how do you make it appealing um, so that we try to get more people to eat better sure yeah so i mean i think actually um emphasizing enjoyment um you know even aside from health uh, health benefits actually can be really effective in in boosting the appeal and also considering uh, the social context in, in which foods are presented. I mean, interestingly, there's some research that suggests that if you present healthier food in a social context, people pay more attention to it um, and they find it more, more appealing. Um, but it's also perhaps around the language that's used, you know, when we're talking about healthier foods versus perhaps more indulgent or, um, you know, less sort of staple foods. Um, you know, often when we're talking about those sort of tastier foods, it's all about the sensory experience, you know, how delicious things are. Whereas, you know, on the other side, if we're sort of talking about healthier foods, we tend to sort of use much more descriptive language, you know, referring to the health benefits. But of course, we know that um, how, how we talk about uh, food can actually then influence um, our expectations about how it's going to taste, and that sort of anticipation that we might get, you know, from, from thinking about um, the consumption. So I think if we only you sort of focus on the health benefits, we're not going to get those, those added effects um, around emphasizing, um, you know, food tastiness and, and enjoyment. So, and in, well, and in fact, <laughs> for some people, you know, healthy equals untasty. So o overcoming those sort of um, barriers is important and perhaps, you know, thinking more about the pleasure of eating and the shared experiences could could be uh, effective, I think. Very interesting. So, Aaron, you and I did a panel, um, I think, two years ago. I kind of lose track of time, but I, I think I rem well, I know my big takeaway at the end of that conversation was that um, one of the big shifts is that with social media, it's not this, you know, from the manufacturer to the consumer communication, it's a conversation. And, and so I'm really curious to know what you have um, experienced over time, what changes that you've seen, what type of impact do you think you have? Do you see people telling you, oh, I've changed my mind or, but can you just talk a little bit about that? Who are your followers and what changes that you've seen since you've been doing this? Yeah, kind of like you said at the start, I've been seeing a lot more science communicators, people sort of pushing back against um, misinformation. So that's really nice to kind of have a community of people that are doing that and it's not just me. So um, that's that's something that has changed, I feel like, within the past couple years. Um, you know, I see with people that follow me too, maybe when they start following me, they don't necessarily agree with what I'm saying, um, but they, you know, they're open to listening. And, um, you know, I get messages all the time too of people just thanking me for helping with their relationship with food or an eating disorder or something like that. So I think just, you know, cause again, like so much of this misinformation, if there wasn't science communicators out there, like consumers wouldn't necessarily know if it's true or not. And so, I think there are more people like seeking out other content and content, you know, more science based content. And I feel like 
I feel like, you know, through COVID and everything like that, it, it might have helped as well because you had like doctors and epidemiologists and all those types of people joining social media and just, you know, consumers were seeking out more science based content. So I think that really has changed in the past couple of years. Yeah, I think, and I think another thing on our last, um, our last panel, because we also had farm babe there as well. And I think one thing that you all talked about was you need many voices to really have an impact. And so sometimes you were teaming up with other people to make sure that certain topics got a lot of impact as well, because listening to Tom talk about, I don't even know how you keep track of it all. It moves fast. It's global. You have so many different. Um, topics and so on. So maybe Tom over to you to just explore this a little bit more. We know that there's people that are when we ask consumers about their global concerns, personal health was always number one for years and years and years. Two years ago, we saw or last year was the first year we, we saw health of the planet surpass personal health. Um, this year, when we did uh, in the most recent survey that we did, we also saw things like political instability and in the European countries and the US was number one, right? So there's all these changes. We also know that when we have been asking consumers about inflation, nobody wants to, to compromise on anything. When you ask, what will you not give up? I will not give up local. I will not give up sustainability. I will not give up, you know, it's so interesting, basically nothing. And then another thing that we've been talking about a couple of years is the role that food plays in our happiness. So it's, it's what I eat is good for me, but it also makes me feel, what I eat makes me feel good about myself. So can you maybe just talk about how all this comes together and what you think we're going to see next in terms of content? What can manufacturers learn from this and how should they manage the way they think about all this stuff and how they use the information? I think you have to look at all those things through two lenses. And one of them is, it's frankly a slightly skeptical lens. Yeah, you know, we do have to take what consumers tell us with a pinch of salt, if you'll forgive the food based uh, pun, but you know, it's, there's what people say they are thinking about and what they say their priorities are and then actually how they behave when they get into the supermarket. And those two aren't always the same thing. You know, they like to believe themselves to be someone who prioritizes the planet or believe themselves to be someone who won't compromise. But, you know, when the wallet's empty, when the energy bills are rising um, or when, you know, no one's looking and you're sort of reaching in for that packet of, you know, <laughs> sort of, you know not necessarily very sustainable, you know, products because it's a particular favorite of your kids and you want to put a smile on their face you know, there's always that slightly different behavior so partly you have to look at things with a slightly skeptical lens nonetheless none of those things are unimportant we've got to understand the importance of all of those things and again we've got to understand them through the second lens which is one of status and this really sort of picks up on what suzanne was saying you know what you know drives changes in behavior one of them has been the changing nature of status for us as individuals over the last few years and whereas you go back to the sort of 80s and even 90s our status is very much defined in, in sort of socially in a lot of cases by what we own what we could afford to have the car we drove the house we lived in the area we lived in in this sort of global digital society increasingly our status is defined by what we do and what we can show we do uh, and so if you are um, you know, buying products and showing that you've purchased products that demonstrate a certain mindset or a certain set of behaviors, ones that put you in line with those social groups that Suzanne was talking about that you might want to ape and, and be like, then you're going to do that. And in many ways, I think that's what drives some of this green um, or sort of ethical or healthy behavior. It's that desire to demonstrate that I'm doing these things that align with this particular group and gives me that sense of status. And so you know, what, what this, this, you've got the green aspect, you've got the sort of aspirational aspect, you've got the healthy aspect. But I think innovation's really interesting there as well. You know what 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 plays really well on social media is often novelty, something new, something different. And I think that's got some really interesting impact, certainly for some of my clients in the in the food world, where they're looking at this, saying, okay, how can we do something different? How can we do something new? You know, and the range of different ingredients you've got to do that with over the last few years is really interesting. Interesting. You know, it's one place where where you know nuts and almonds is really interesting because you've got this array of different formats to play with that's being used already. You know, we've seen it in you know in a variety of new drinks, focusing on that sort of desire for protein. We've seen it in a variety of different snack bars, catering to that sort of very different working lifestyle. You know, I think that innovation piece and picking up on that and connecting it to people's sense of status, I'm the first one to have something new. I think that's really interesting too.
Yeah, I think that is interesting, but kind of the message I hear from you is that is the same as it's always been know your consumer. Because yeah, there are absolutely. so many, so many segments that I think about. I joke all the time about my TikTok dermatologist because somehow I'm on skin health TikTok, right? But I also find myself, and I don't know if it's well, I even see it. I have two Gen Z girls really seeking out the experts, right? And they want more expert kind of advice, and they're not maybe they're also not into or their status is slightly different. It's clear skin maybe versus, you know, blingy kind of things and so on. So, but okay, know your know your consumer. That never changes. And and try to find out. I hear a lot of companies, a lot of our customers talk about social listening, social listening. And um, and I guess you still have to know what your question is and you have to know your customer that you can't just take the the the, the fads or the trends or those, as you said, those the novelty yeah. factor, the, no, the novelty topics that are just... Yeah, w what defines status for them and be a little bit sceptical about when they tell you what they want? <laughs> Good advice. Okay, Suzanne, I'm going to give you one of the big challenging topics, and that's plant-based. Um, plant-based is kind of, well, it's kind of taken over our lives. We do a lot of projects, but I spent a lot of time in plant-based world, and I think so many people are using the Beyond Meat share price as the as the barometer for this and i i've repeated myself a hundred times don't let it be the barometer because we're at the beginning of the beginning right but we know that taste and texture are a challenge but we also know that consumers are telling us in our research stop just trying to mimic you know i don't want to pay 20 percent more for a hamburger that tastes 20 percent worse give me something different um give me you know egg salad spaghetti other things that can be plant-based but um can you maybe talk about what we can learn or what can the food industry learn about some of these plant-based topics and, and what can the industry do to make them seem more appealing or learn more about them? I mean, I think, again, expectations um, are probably quite important here. So, you know, what we're kind of bringing, you know, to the, to the eating experience, because I think, you know, potentially if you've got some sort of mismatch there between you know, what we expect in terms of things like taste and texture and then what we actually get, you know, if if those two things aren't aligned, then, you know, that's not going to be good for the consumption experience. So I think um, thinking about, you know, what those expectations are and also, you know, how they might be um, managed, I suppose, in a sense, especially when it comes to novel products, because, of course, you know, we've got quite fixed ideas about, foods that we're familiar with, we've got a lot of experience of consuming. But if it's something new, then I think we're much more open then to having those those expectations managed and, and thinking about what, you know, the alignment is between how things are packaged and, and labeled and what that says about the product and then how that fits, you know, with what you're actually getting. So I think, you know, um, ha having that sort of, um, alignment there in terms of the the expectations and the experiences is, is good um because especially for plant-based products you know that there there might be issues there which which could explain why people uh, are not fully satisfied with some of some of the products that are out there um but again there's also quite diverse expectations that people are going to be bringing that sort of link to uh, identity as well as, as Tom was saying, you know, so how does it fit, you know, with my identity, especially when it comes to things like meat substitutes, you know, um, thinking about the identity of the consumer and how that might drive the decision making could also be uh, interesting. Good point. Okay, so now I'm going to ask the, the big question to all of you. So I hope you can all think of what you want to answer. So we just heard about know your consumer, but at the same time, you now have a very different kind of focus group um, that you can learn from online. So what advice would you all give food manufacturers who want to you know, really leverage social media, use social listening when it comes to product development and marketing? So who'd like to go first? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I mean, I, I'd just like to agree with what Tom said earlier on about, you know, striking a note of caution, because, you know, I think in, in terms of making assumptions about what's going on, you know, digitally and how that relates to what people are actually doing and what that what they're really consuming, you know, there isn't always going to be that alignment there. But 
I guess if you can then think about, you know, the information from social media and sort of triangulating that with other sources of information, then that's that's probably going to be, um, you know, preferable. Um, but, you know, it, it's great from the perspective of having, you know, a really diverse population that you can get very quick feedback from. I was going to say, um... Yeah, again, it's food based pun. If we can take a lesson from the, uh, the lean startup book from startup land, where you don't really know anything if you're just listening until you actually put a test in the market. And so I'd encourage people to make, you know, social media, not just about, you know, very sort of one sided listening exercise, but put stuff out there, test it, see what the response is. You know, maybe find some influencers to partner with or create your own sort of sub brand that you can experiment with without risking your own sort of core brand. And get stuff out there and see what the response is like and be part of the conversation rather than just sort of keeping an ear to the ground because you'll get much better results and actually you'll be able to leverage both your your learning but also your leverage at the same time. Erin, I think just being able to quickly get in on trends is really important. Um, you know, just being more nimble like on social media with messaging and um creating content that's timely and then also this in the same way like partnering with you know science-based communicators if you want to like debunk certain myths regarding you know there's there's myths on pretty much sorry <clears throat> pretty much every food out there so <clears throat> partnering with science communicators and then again like doing it more quickly so you're not you know waiting a month until like nobody remembers it so i just think yeah, I mean, I think there's a big opportunity for brands um, to get on social media and yeah, like just try it out too. I mean, just put some stuff out there, see how it goes. And I feel like it's somewhere where you can like experiment with things. I mean, that's kind of how I started too. Like I was just like, oh, I'm just gonna start making videos and see what happens. And so obviously I know brands have <laughs> a lot more that they have to, you know, um, answer to behind that. But yeah, I think just being, being more nimble, being able to get in on trends, um, being able to, since there are so many of us science communicators out there now, I think, I think utilizing us, I mean, we're already debunking things. So partnering with us to debunk certain myths or misconceptions, I think can be really helpful too. Could you like, tell us, what do you think your biggest, the biggest misconception that you come across with what you do is? Man, that's a that's a tough question. Um, I I I mean, a lot of it is regarding like uh, front of package like marketing on foods. I would say like a lot of it is like, what does this you know what does this label mean? Like, what does it actually? I feel like consumers are are wanting to know like they're not as much just like oh this says natural. I'm I'm gonna buy you know like I'm sure there are still there is still that, but. I feel like consumers are questioning things more too. Like, you know, if there's like a label for sustainability, like what does that actually mean? Does it actually mean it's more sustainable? So I just feel like, um, you know, there are so many misconceptions regarding like how foods are marketed and what labels mean, what they don't mean. Um, and I think consumers are starting to kind of question those things a little bit more. I think that's a huge insight that that's maybe because we also see that, especially environmental labels, consumers are, are very overwhelmed. But if people are starting to um, really question the, the labels that are being used, um, maybe that's the time to start the conversation to talk about what it means to you. Right? So I think, I think that's a huge insight. Um, okay, we're going to move to, does anybody have anything else to add or anything that you would like to say before we move on to our polling question results and Q and a. No, all good. Okay, all good. So, okay, we have to ask our producer Arturo if I can see the results of the polling question. Um, I don't see it yet, so maybe that will come up. Oh, there we go. Okay, so has social media ever influenced um, what you do? So we see that um, about half said yes and half had no answer, but so it, yeah, 51% of people said it does have an impact. So, um, I think that's really interesting that people are doing some social listening and, and following trends. And I think we have some questions that kind of support that. So the first one is, do you see social media platforms as a good venue to influence customers around niche products? Does anybody have any experience or any thoughts around that? 
And I think it sort of picks up on 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 a point that Suzanne picked up on earlier, which is in, in some ways every product is a niche product. You know, we, we there are we, we live in this world of sort of exploded um, mass media where there's very few properties that connect everybody, and everybody's you know we're all in sort of niches, very small niches. Um, and I think you know a lot of the the efforts of the industry of the next few years is going to be the ability to cater to more smaller niches and where you're going to come across those you're going to find them first of all on social media i suspect um i think the the you know the prospect for ai is twofold here you know number one it's in discovery you know can it sift the the vast array of data and conversations out there and find us those ones that perhaps have an audience big enough to justify catering for, or perhaps even tweaking and more likely remarketing an existing product to that niche. Um, and then, you know, can it, um, you know, is there something that it can do in terms of, you know, almost creating a you know, product and i think that's a, a little way off but if you look at what chat gpt has been doing in terms of creating copy and creating code you know could we actually throw a database of foodstuffs at, a, at an open ai technology like that and say here's the audience you're, you're catering for you start to create new products um, I think that would be a very interesting innovation if somebody wanted to start to play with it and you, you could probably build a proof of concept relatively quickly that's interesting. Anybody else have anything to add? But then let's move on to, so Aaron, you talked about the speed that things move. And so someone says, I think it's important to understand the difference between a fad and a trend. So everybody always wants to know, like, you know, if there's two products, it's too early. If there's 200, I'm too late. I think about the, I think the unicorn Starbucks drink, the avocado drink from Korea, I think that came out one time. And, and now we do see a lot of unicorn flavor, unicorn, like colors and so on, but is yeah. How do you know when it's going to be just a fad or if it's going to be a trend? Any hints or advice? I I honestly don't know. I mean, it's it, it, that's the wild card with social media so much too. It's like something will blow up and it's like, wow, how did that happen? I mean, I guess I don't have the answer for that. Um, again, I think it's just trying different things and kind of seeing what sticks, what doesn't stick, but. I mean, even with my content, you know, I'll create something and I'm like really researching something and I'll put something out like nobody cares and then I'll just do something funny and it's like it goes viral. So, I mean, I think I think it's really hard. It's hard to know what's going to stick, what's, you know, going to go viral, what people will care about, what they won't really care about. So I don't know. I don't <laughs> I don't really have the answer. Oh, well, what about, can you tell us maybe what one of your big surprises was? Was there something that really surprised you that this stuck or didn't stick or? Oh, man, I don't know if there's like one, I guess. Well, I mean, I think the thing, the thing too, is just making sure, like keeping content as short as possible as well. Like people have, you know, shorter and shorter attention spans. So I think like getting all the information in, in the shortest amount of time possible, you know, potentially trying to make it like funny or interesting um but yeah i mean there's there have been videos where i can't think of anything in particular but you know i'll just like i think it's kind of funny and i'll post it and i'm like nobody's gonna think this is funny and then like you know a lot of people like start sharing it and you know like i said i'll post something that i think is something like really interesting information and it's too boring like people don't really care so yeah so the delivery is important too. So sometimes oh, that can have a bigger impact yeah. than even the, the seriousness of the importance of the topic. Yeah. So that leads us really well into the next question because it says social media sparks new wellness trends as well. Is there advice on how to cater to these without overpromising or misleading? So now you've told us it needs to be short, it needs to be kind of funny, and now you need to educate but not overpromise or mislead. Any advice for the industry? I mean, I would just say make sure you're not making like false claims. I mean, you know, like I said, I think consumers are questioning those things more. And so I think there's a way to do it to be factual without without making false claims or spreading misinformation. Um, I mean, yeah, so I think you can definitely like promote healthier products or um, quote unquote wellness without making it false or, you know, uh, you know, stating false claims um, because now that there are so many of us science communicators out there, you have to be aware too that like somebody will probably call it out if you're making false claims. So there's that too. Yeah. Suzanne, anything to add? I mean, I, I agree with all of that. Um, I mean, 
you know, I think you can you can be in in that space, as Erin says, you know, without without having to, you know, come up with an, anything that's um, over over promising. And it's clearly, you know, um, one of one of the areas in which, uh, you know, it, it is definitely growing, growing interest. So, um, you know, perhaps uh, relating it, you know, to social trends, you know, could could be um, interesting. Suzanne, while you're talking, another question just came in about um, how do we expect or how do you expect plant based innovation to evolve? Have the opportunities changed? So maybe you can add something to to that as well. Yeah, I mean, obviously things have um, been, you know, taking off uh, immensely. Uh, so, I mean, I'm not, I'm not quite sure how it's going to evolve. Tom's probably got a better idea about that than me, I would say. I think there's, there's a couple of things. I think we're probably going to see a bit of a backlash. If we're, in fact, I think we're already seeing a bit of a backlash on things that sort of fail the natural test that are you know, technically plant-based, but have been through you know, 18 million processes to produce something um, that maybe don't fulfill consumers' aspirations in terms of either their health or actually planetary health. Um, and so I think you know, this, 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 although the, the word natural is, you know, it doesn't necessarily have a clear meaning in this context, people are looking for something that's plant-based and natural that fulfills all of those aspirations. I think that's going to be a big trend over the next year. Um, but also just, you know, th there's an old phrase saying about technology that, you know, anything invented after you're 15 years old is just stuff. You know, well, before you're 15 years old is just stuff. Yeah, yeah, we've got a generation now who've grown up with plant-based. I think that as a term is probably going to, to an extent, fade into the background, uh, and it just becomes part of the normal mix of our diet, potentially a, you know, a lower meat um, diet, a lot of alternatives in there, a lot more diversity in that diet. Um, so you know, I think there's, there's probably a limited lifespan. We can use it as a marketing term, as, an, a, different, as a differentiator, um, and very much that focus on sort of um, more the things that tick that natural box. Yeah. Uh, and I'm just going to add here because, of course, I'm also a market researcher and I recorded a video earlier this week to talk about what we saw at the big food ingredients exhibition in Paris last fall. Um, I thought it was an absolute showcase of innovation and I don't know, and especially in plant based, I don't know if it's because people had time over the pandemic, maybe that they had more time to do some bigger projects, but there were, it was absolutely full of innovation addressing these topics, addressing cleaner label, more simple processing, um, different benefits. And also there's kind of an ecosystem of ingredients of, I would say clean label ingredients that will support plant-based, right? With simpler lists and so on. So anybody who's writing off plant-based, I, I will bet against you because it's gonna happen. Some European governments have a protein transition strategy saying that plants have to play a bigger role in, in the protein ecosystem and in, in, in Europe. Um, so it's going to happen. It's absolutely going to happen. And I agree with you. It's, but I think we're, I, I was absolutely blown away by the innovation that we saw. So and I'm very I optimistic. Hi, I would just add that, you know, from almonds perspective, we feel that almonds play very well in the space in terms of plant based and, you know, in terms of it not being just a fad or a trend, but we actually do add the nutritional value to um, products that are being developed with any of the forms that you see for almonds. So we're excited about that opportunity in, in being able to expand the plant based space with using the forms of flour or oil or anything else that's gluten free. So we're excited about that opportunity. It really ticks the natural box as well, I think. Agreed. That's why it keeps ticking. Almonds keep ticking boxes and it is a plant, you know? So sometimes maybe it doesn't seem the most obvious thing, but nuts are absolutely plants. Um, Here's a, here's a compliment um, from someone in Germany saying, thanks for talking about the false information on the internet. As a dietitian, it's sometimes shocking how false information about nutrition is spread on the internet with lots of followers, especially kids on TikTok. Best regards from Germany. So a compliment um, to all of you. And I think Aaron, you were definitely a fighter out there. So um, on the front line of misinformation. So some appreciation from someone. Um, Here's another one, which I think is interesting. How important is certified organic in the discussion today, um, in particularly in plant-based? Um, I know, Erin, we had a big discussion about organic when we did um, 
the, the, our panel um, a couple of years ago. Um, anybody see organic in, in a lot of conversations or topics on social media? I mean, I guess in my in my realm of, you know, discussing what labels mean, what they don't mean. Uh, again, I think I, I see I I specifically see a lot of uh, consumers questioning it. Like, you know, I'm paying more for this thing that's organic. Like, should I be paying more? What does it mean? You know, I think it means this, and that's why I'm paying more for it. Like, does it really mean that? So. Again, I think a lot of these front of package labels are being questioned by consumers and they're really, you know, especially with, you know, people not making an, as much money and, and things like that. It's like, do I need to be paying more for organic, you know, whereas like maybe before they never really question it because they're like, oh, yeah, I can afford it. I think it's healthier, so I'm going to buy it. But um, I do see a lot of consumers like questioning those labels now and wondering, you know, if they need to purchase, if they need to pay more for those labels. I think that's really interesting. I think that's a big aha moment for me from this from this discussion is around um, confusion around front and pack labeling, which we know it's kind of an issue, but interesting now that that's maybe a bit more under under the spotlight. Um, and I know certainly in our work, a topic that we see coming up more and more is around farming methods, regenerative agriculture. Um, Organic will be part of that, like, and that's something I also want to learn more about yields and what can we expect and, you know, can how far mainstream can it go? And we hear, I think, a little bit less about organic now, but much more about farming methods. So. I'm not, I think, I yeah. Sorry, I think, I think, yeah, I think yeah, you can only pat yourself on the back so many times for each purchase. And, you know, if you're purchasing some purchasing something that is plant based and low, you know, low fat and high protein, you like you, you've, you've patted yourself on the back a few times. You know, does, does it need to have the organic label as well? And it's not that I don't think organic is important. I think it really is as one of the options and certainly as part of the mix. But there, you know, there are so many different pats on the back you can give yourself now with the with the front of the box labeling that you know, organics perhaps lost some of the importance they had five years ago. Yeah, I'm, I'm, and I'm curious, and I'm curious also during COVID that we saw this massive shift back to, I'm going to call it safety and trusted, you know, into big, old, established legacy brands. Um, and I'm curious to see how that evolves over the next couple of years. So, um, oh, yeah, lots, lots more thanks and, 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 you know, appreciation for the work that you're doing against nutritional misinformation. Uh, so, that's kind of. All that we have time for today, um, really interesting conversation. I think, again, my takeaways are the confusion around front of pack, know your consumer, um, and maybe the biggest takeaway of all is that nobody has this completely figured out yet. It's still a big, confusing, messy soup of, of information and, and yeah, information and so on. So thanks to everybody for, for your input and um, I think this is a topic we should continue and maybe in another year, see how things changed, you know, evolved even more. Um, as Cherie said, there is um, a QR code you can do. There'll be a quick survey. There's lots of information. If you click that code, you can go to the new LinkedIn page and so on. Lots of um, product ideas and, and recipes and so on. And um, yeah, I do a lot of these things with the almond board and, and, in my own work as well, but feedback is always great. So thanks for attending and, um, and make sure to give us some feedback and thanks for the great discussion, everybody.